All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Immersive Denver, Immersive Espresso. It's been a while since we had a chance to do one of these, but with the Denver Film Festival bringing in immersive artists from all over the place, including from Denver, um, we decided to strike while the iron is hot and invited Capital W to come chat with us a little bit about what they do, about their show, and uh, maybe what Immersive has to do with film, because I think this is their third Denver Film Festival that they presented on the Immersive track, which is really awesome, awesome and cool. So to kind of just kick things Immersive off, I think- you Denver Film Fest, so that's cool. Right on. So also, um, I, why don't I just go ahead and start with some introductions? I mean, uh, we've got Monica, Lauren, and Christina are capital W. So which one of you wants to start and tell us a little about who you are, how you came to this point, and then we'll talk about capital W in a minute. Lauren, why don't you go first? Sure, great. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Lauren Ludwig. Um, I am one of the founding members of Capital W, which is a company based in Los Angeles. Uh, which he mentioned. And uh, I'm uh, the primary director of our work um, and often one of the writers. Um, and Capital W formed in 2015 when Monica and I were, who had both come from more traditional theater spaces. Um, I had some experience in site specific work. Um, and uh, we kind of had a range of backgrounds that ended up feeding into our interest in immersive. Uh, but we were both really feeling a really strong desire to break out of proscenium bound theater and to do something that felt um, more radical, um, more holistically engaged for the audience. And um, this is right when people were starting to talk about Sleep No More and it was first really hitting in New York. Um, and I saw that show and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I was very curious about the sort of other end of the spectrum, like very intimate immersive theater, one-on-one -on -one, or very small audience experiences. And uh, Monica also was really compelled by that. And so in 2015, we did our first show, which was a mobile adaptation of Shakespeare's Hamlet, staged in a little cargo van that would park around um, the Los Angeles, um, the Hollywood Fringe Festival there. That was where we first did our first show um, and sort of functioned like a food truck. Um, and from there, Capital W has put out um, one new original, like full main stage show a year, basically since. Yeah. yeah. Mon, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm Monica Miklas. I'm the other co-founder of Capital W. And yes, that was a lovely introduction to our work. Um, the themes in our work include um, identity, spirituality, the human connection to nature and our connections to one another. Uh, I would say that emotion is something that we explore a lot in our work. Um, we really, we do feelings. We are feelings people. <laughs> That's one of our main tools in our toolbox. Yes, yes. Um, and our performance style tends to be tends to be quite naturalistic, though um, that's been changing a bit in recent years. We've been um, dabbling in some different media as uh, we've pivoted within COVID times. So we've been doing some remote work um, that's not just Zoom based. Sometimes it uses Zoom, but um, also work on the phone, which has been a fun experience and a, a fun branching out for us. Um, Additionally, I'll mention that I, my background, I've worked in uh, nonprofits for a long time, um, arts and culture industry in Los Angeles. I'm an event planner, event producer. Um, and I'm also one of the co-founders of the League of Experiential and Immersive Artists, which is an industry group for folks in our world based in LA. Um, very, sort of a, a sister organization, I would say, to the, what's happening in the Denver immersive community. Um, yeah, that, that's our story. That's my story. Um, Christina? Hi, uh, I'm Christina Bryan. I am the third and uh, newest member of Capital W. Uh, I'm our production manager primarily uh, and lately have sort of also become more developmentally involved, um, especially with Fire Season. That was the first show that I really helped to develop uh, during my time here uh, and it's been pretty cool. My main background is in stage management and uh, like live event production, um, but I have worn many hats. Uh, I've worked in film, I've worked in music festivals, I've worked on live TV award shows, kind of all across the spectrum. But for me, 
live theater was always sort of my touchstone and like what came, what I kept coming back to creatively. Um, and as immersive kind of took off in Los Angeles, I had having had a lot of experience with site specific work and Hollywood fringe style theater um, sort of got introduced to Lauren and Monica after, was it 2018? Your, yeah, Rochester 2018. Um, and kind of went from there. Uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy time doing theater yeah. <laughs> in the pandemic. It has but <laughs> it's, I think the immersive, the immersive community uh, is actually really primed to be able to adapt really well for this kind of, um, you know, like large global reckoning. So I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> I agree with that. Doing our best. Yeah. 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 What a wonderful introduction. Now, the downside is there's at least three different tracks we can take just exploring your backgrounds. I mean, award shows, we just want to talk about that. But let's talk about the main event. You guys flew into Denver today to run a, a new show for, for Denver, Fire Season. Can you tell us a little bit about what is Fire Season? What's the experience like? And maybe even a little dose of like what makes it immersive? Sure. So uh, I, and I, I failed to mention this before, um, I wrote and perform Fire Season. Um, Fire Season is a, a meditation on what it means to live a life through climate change. The piece involves a series of stories, essays, uh, reworked myths um, that all connect to the idea of climate change and use fire and wildfire as a lens to engage with what's happening to the climate. Um, the audience experience of this show, when you arrive, you're outfitted with uh, a little FM radio receiver that you wear around your neck and headphones and a little hiking stool. And then the audience can explore a park area at will while listening to a live broadcast of the show. Um, here in Denver, we're performing at Bear Creek Lake Park in Lakewood, um, which has a beautiful creek that runs through it, and the, it's surrounded by grasslands, where actually there happened to be a grass fire earlier this year in February. Um, I, I don't want to give too much away because I think a lot of the folks on the Zoom may end up seeing the show this week. Um, I will say that most of the show is a solo experience, but not entirely. There's a, a moment of connection that we think is a really uh, critical part of the larger piece. Lauren, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Maybe hit on the immersive nature of the show? Yeah, this was a show uh, that's probably the closest thing we've ever done or will ever do to like a one person storytelling show that you might traditionally see staged in a black box yep. in downtown New York kind of vibe. Um, it was all written by Monica, and even though we briefly flirted with the idea of somebody else or other people collaboratively performing it, it ultimately really felt best when performed solely by Monica. Um, but we really do, really from the beginning, it also felt very clear that the words wanted to be experienced in the landscape that they are about. And so it's immersive for us in that it's very uh, environmentally um, submersive. Uh, we want you like fully in the wilderness, fully in the landscape and collaborating with that landscape in um, a really proactive way um, in terms of you choosing where you get to go on your journey during the show. Um, and that makes it quite immersive to us. Um, we think of immersive for us, the definition is basically, is it an environmentally surrounding piece? And do you have some impact on your own uh, experience of the narrative? Um, can you impact the narrative in some way? Not necessarily changing the outcome, but at the very least changing the series of images that you receive from the show in a way. Um, so definitely this show hits both those parameters, um, though it's for us on the very low end of like talking with the actors kind of immersive. It's, which we've done a show that, you know, some shows that are very much that, but we really, really as a company don't ascribe to any particular style. We really try to let the content dictate the content dictate the style of immersive interaction for us. I'll also add that this uh, this show was completely developed and originally produced during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so we not only creating a, an outdoor show that had a lot of different variables 
uh, was already a challenge, but adding on top of that being, um, you know, COVID safe and being very, very mindful. We performed it, uh, our first run was last fall before vaccines were readily available. So it was, um, we sort of tasked ourselves with having done very successful and very um, fulfilling remote theater uh, projects. Uh, on the phone and over Zoom, like Monica mentioned, uh, we sort of tasked ourselves with how can we do live theater that feels safe, um, that is also poignant, uh, and that is connective, because I think that's something that we all felt was lacking in a lot of the Zoom theater that came out of the pandemic. So that was also a big part of it for us. Yeah, and to Christina's point, it was important to us that it not feel like the show had been adapted to pandemic requirements. Right. It, this really is the best container for this content. What, you know, whether or not, and then additionally, yes, it is COVID safe, so. Yeah, it was very organic. Yeah, I agree with that. That's awesome. I, I, I'm curious, um, you know, on your website, you describe Capital W as a, as a um, experimental art group. Um, and then here you are in the context of immersive. I mean, for each of you, when did you discover that you were an immersive artist or, or are you still uh, at odds with that definition? <laughs> what <a> question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, go on, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy to be called that. And I think that's usually what I say about myself. I'm not sure that's true of everyone within Capital W. Um, I usually say theater artist for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I think immersive, it means something different to everyone. And so actually something we noticed with fire season is that people came into it, some people came into it with a certain set of expectations and mostly people who'd seen our other work were like, why nobody's talking to me? Like, I can't talk to anyone. This isn't immersive. It's like, well, it is it, by our definition, but but it is, it may not be by someone else's. Um, and which is why when we talk, you know, in the way we talk about ourselves as a company is not necessarily to say we are an immersive theater company. It is to say, we, we play with boundaries. We play with form. We are not married to a specific form. Um, it's not impossible that we'd ever do a proscenium bound show. I don't see that happening. I don't think that it's likely, but it's not impossible. Um, and I think we're, yeah, we, we are not looking to be bound by labels, but if other people want to do that, I don't know. It doesn't bother me as an artist, but yeah. we're not trying to do that as a company. No, like if we were to do a proscenium bound show, it would be about the fact that it was proscenium bound. It wouldn't okay. be just like- It would be very meta. It'd be about theater. It'd be about, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, uh, I feel like I grew up in a space where there was a real siloing of different art forms. Like there was like, I went to Northwestern, which had at the time a theater training program that was very traditional. Um, and then like the TV and film department was so separate. Like those people weren't training in our acting classes, even though they wanted to be film directors and they need to deal with actors. And we weren't, our theater department was also not training with the performance studies department, which is um, much more about sort of like, um, it's not entirely about performance art, but it's much more in a sort of a radical experimental theatrical space. And so like none of those people were walking. So I think like I started out thinking I was a theater person then getting interested in television and film and then being like, I got to choose. And then being like, wait, this is crazy. I don't have to choose. And then on top of that, like when I would hear, I would always through the years hear about theater companies doing really interesting stuff, like take like in my twenties, I'm like, oh, these people took over the subway car and just like did this scene in the car or like, oh, those people like did this thing that went across like eight different rooftops in New York. Or like, I kept hearing about those things and always being like, God, I want to do those things. They sound so interested and engaging. And I do sometimes like sitting in a normal theater, but it's got to be a really excellent show for me to really feel fully engaged. So I just think eventually by my, around my early thirties, I started to be like, why am I, why am I waiting for the art form that brings together everything I love about um, performance and art? Why don't we just start making that art that we want to see? And it hap our interest in that happened to co um, coincide with Los Angeles uh, immersive theater boom. 
which, so then we kind of got swept in and called that and labeled as solely that in a way that felt good, I would say for a while. Like it felt like, oh, there's a community. There's other people who love this. We're real art nerds. We like to nerd out and talk about like, you know, talk shop with other people who love this thing. And I would say that in the last two years, I started, I started to feel like, why don't, we are not making choices as a company that are about necessarily like making a huge financially uh, sustainable piece of work. We're making choices that are much closer to a traditional sort of not-for-profit theater company. We are making more, like we keep making more radical kind of choices around like, well, we care about this for the art, even if it means that we have to fundraise and make no money. So we started to see ourselves as like a singular artist that just was composed of several, uh, several artists, which is why we call ourselves a radical theater collaboration. And for, for us, that means that like, it's probably always going to be interactive or immersive in some way, but we really want to allow our taste and our voice to expand and evolve over the years as we keep making this stuff. Right. I'll also add briefly, there's this concept of total theater that is, I, I wasn't, I don't have a, I didn't study theater as an undergraduate, but I went to theater management grad school. And so didn't really encounter this idea until we were starting to work on Hamlet Mobile. But the, in the West, we separate all these art forms out. There is theater, there is opera, there is dance, there is uh, music, they are separate. Um, and in India and in China, in those performance traditions, things are not separated in the same way. It's, it is a total theater that encompasses all of those different art forms. And I actually started thinking about this a lot when I was writing some fake lectures as as a like diegetic audio to play in the Hamlet mobile like from the point of view of this character um but then as I did it actually really came to believe it more and more that that's sort of what we're we're looking to to not be bound by these artificial boundaries and to just create and see what happens yeah, I would say for me that I love anything that um, like breaks down boundaries or plays with format or like genre bends. I love that in books, in movies, in theater. Um, and I'm that's the kind of art I'm attracted to as a consumer. Um, and I was in the LA theater community for a long time working on a lot of black box theater, uh, working on a lot of like proscenium based theater and realizing that there was starting the disconnect between the art that I wanted to experience and the art that I was working on was getting bigger and bigger. And it got to a point where I decided that I wanted to close that gap and start participating and creating the art that I wanted to see, kind of like what Lauren was talking about. Um, and so I had worked on a couple different, either site-specific or like immersive adjacent, immersive light, um, productions before I had gotten looped in with capital W. Uh, and from there it was like, oh, this is what I want to be working on. And because we as a company aren't limiting ourselves to one type of immersive experience or another, it, it really allows this, um, like fostering of any, anything could happen. Uh, like we could, and the shows that capital W has done in the past have taken place all over. Um, Hamlet, Mobile was, Hamlet Mobile wasn't a van, as we've said. We had shows that take place in bars, in people's houses, uh, in parks. And so that to me is really exciting that like we could do a show anywhere. We could create a show that can happen anywhere. Um, it feels really like grassroots, like renegade radical theater, um, like in its sort of most like uh, artistic, weird, nerdy form. And that's really exciting for me personally. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. And um, when when Jenny Filippetti and who's on from from Italy, she's beaming in from overseas here. Um, when, when we when we put uh, Immersive Denver together, that was really what we were interested. in. We were interested in that kind of that boundary crossing, yeah. frothiness of getting people together. Which brings me to the next question. I really want want to ask you is um, so at least in the Denver market, Capital W is known are those folks that come out and do immersive shows during the film festival. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm just interested to hear you tease out a little bit the relationship between theater, immersive art and entertainment and film, or AKA, what the hell are a bunch of theater people doing at a festival of cinema? 
I'll take this because I spent a lot of time in the yeah. house in like Hollywood. I because I I I yeah, I still do TV and film. I really love it. Um, and I have watched over the last five or six years film festivals first start to have virtual reality pieces, right? So they'd have all the VR goggles in one big room. And then slowly I watched some of the curators of those uh, segments of the festival push to then have some live performance. Because if we're calling it interactive, everybody who's seen most VR stuff knows it's not really interactive. It's it's encompassing, it's all consuming, right? But it's not interactive. Some of it is um, certainly, uh, but not, but some of it's just a passive reception of a, of a short film. So I am very curious about this as well. Um, Landon Zakheim, who programs this part of the festival, right? You guys know that, yeah. And he, uh, um, I kind of like half expected him to just pop up on the Zoom and like, <laughs> like Candyman style. Uh, I've invoked his name. Um, yeah, so Landon, I think ha deserves a lot of credit, certainly for Denver in terms of having a real vision around like people who, if, if you have found that your film festival goers have a hunger for VR, that you might very well find that they're going to have a hunger for this other work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically sort of like, pushing the film festivals to become more holistic arts festivals, which I do think is generally great because again, the siloing of theater festivals versus film festivals reduces cross-pollinization. I mean, everybody who's been to a festival knows the best part is hanging out at the bar, or the festival annex and chatting with other artists. And if all the other artists are just like you, the number of ideas that are new and fresh that come out of that festival are probably necessarily limited. And so when these festivals start to bring in more different uh, and diverse artists in all the senses of that word, it only helps us as a, you know, as a group of artists, as a species trying to advance uh, a sort of different narrative, uh, you know, what, you know, why are we all doing this? So I think if we're looking for um, new sparks to come out of these spaces, it's a really positive change. Um, and we have found Denver to be the most welcoming space for immersive besides Los Angeles for us, uh, you know, it, as, as welcoming as Los Angeles, not to compare at all, but like, um, you know, we've been three times with the festival and we went, we were here once in 2019 with at the DCPA when they uh, commission us to do a piece. So uh, it's really cool how much audiences in the city seem to have a hunger for this work. It's, it's very, very exciting to come visit. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, Denver is is young enough to not have some of those um, fences that other cities might have, but um, we're excited. We, we really love the, the work that the Denver Film Festival is doing to actually help bring Immersive to Denver along with DCPA and others. Um, I, I do want to see if this is starting to, to froth some, some uh, ideas in the audience. And if anybody has a question, um, feel free to pop on camera or raise your hand or whatever. And um, I'd love to hear from you. I, 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 this being a group generally of, of fellow producers and artists, I'm just curious to hear some things about kind of where you see <coughs> um, the, the state of the art going forward kind of in, in the, the middle of COVID and the future of an art form that depends on, on, on consent and safety. But now that's become so foregrounded that you sometimes wonder if there's anything left. But can you talk a little bit about what's what's wh where's where's immersive art and entertainment for you? Sure, uh, I actually worked on a, a major project this summer outside of Capital W called Brassroots District, which was a live funk concert with an immersive story around it. Um, and I actually there was another show in Los Angeles this fall that had a similar setup. And I was contacted by someone about the same kind of setup too. So I think there's kind of a zeitgeist around music in the immersive space, which is really exciting to me because um, Lauren and I actually met in a comedy group that does music, live music and sketch comedy. So, and, and in college I worked in musicals. So it's actually this sub thread to my career. I never quite think about <laughs> that there was a lot of music in it. Um, I will say that I that show was outdoors. Um, audiences seemed very excited at first. Our first few weekends were packed. And then the Delta variant picked up and our sales cratered. And I, I know from colleagues in the field in Los Angeles that the same thing was happening to them. It wasn't just us. Um, and so I think sales have been 
um, a little underwhelming coming back this summer. I think people are tentative. The people who are there, the people who come feel safe. And I think people are doing a pretty good job of making safe experiences or, or mitigating risk as much as they can. So I think producers are actually being pretty responsible, uh, at least from what I've seen. Um, but it's like the, the self-selection is happening among the audience. So a lot of people are just still staying home. And then the people who get there tend to have pretty good experiences. But these are also probably people who are traveling or going to the mall or going out to restaurants. And I have to say, I'm getting much more comfortable with that myself. So I'm kind of one of those people, like I'm eating inside, even in Los Angeles, um, where we have mask mandates still. Um, the last thing I'll say is I think that ticket prices have, are, are not, we are not gonna rebound to the same place we were before the pandemic, which is probably a good thing because sale uh, ticket prices were just spiraling up, 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 up. And I don't think that was sustainable. So I think the big push within the field among producers is how do we create sustainable business models for immersive work, um, which is actually, I think, harder on a large scale than it is on the scale that Capital W usually works with. Because if we had a, a great new idea for a 10 person and audience show, I feel confident we could fundraise to make it happen. But if we had a great idea for a show for a hundred people in an audience, I don't exactly know where that money would come from. And I think a lot of producers are, are in that place right now. Yeah, our budgets, I, we like being transparent about money. Yeah. So I think it might be helpful for people. Like our budgets are always $10,000 or less. <laughs> fun day. And we've definitely done shows that were just $1,500. Um, and then uh, everything after that is a huge step up in terms of trying to fundraise. <laughs> Um, again, not to say we have some ideas that would take more serious capital and we're trying to work that out yeah. um, and not have it be a, an assumption that we, you know, aren't just one or two degrees away from people because I think we are, but it's definitely not where we have spent our time cultivating relationships. Um, that's another reason we tend to think of ourselves more as we stopped trying to use the word immersive all the time as a descriptor of our theater company, because we found the traditional theater um, theater world sort of, we have found that there's sometimes a looking down on the immerse, the current immersive space or boom in like right. a, you know what I mean? There's like a little bit of like a, well, you guys are doing theme parks or you guys are doing haunted houses or you guys are like- no, Or like selfie like, museums. Yeah. yeah, you're all doing, exactly. You're doing Instagram palaces. Like, no and if you don't have a champion like Charlie Miller at your institution, there's yeah. nobody to tell you otherwise. Yeah, so we found so we found that starting to reframe ourselves as like, no, we're just a normal, we're, we're an experimental theater company. You guys know what this is. It helps some, it, we're hopeful that also some more traditional um, institutions might better understand how they could help uh, a company like ours or curate our work or, you know, commission us to do, to make more stuff. So that's another avenue we, we like to look at. Yeah. I'll kind of loop into um, like what Monica was talking about earlier. Because I think uh, I'm on the other side of, of the spectrum in terms of I'm still pretty COVID hesitant as an individual person going about the world. Uh, I have a partner who works in a hospital, so it's still like a very big part of my day to day. Um, and I think so that makes me particularly conscientious of um, the spaces I move in in public, but also in terms of when I'm a part of a crowd, whether that's a crowd of five or a crowd of 50, uh, I wanna know what, you know, like what safety measures have been put in place. I wanna know that the producers or whoever the organizers are, are thinking about safety. Um, and, you know, being, the immersive space is always very much, or should it be when it's done well, should always be thinking about safety um, from the audience perspective, from the performer's perspective. Um, and that's not just physical safety, that's also like consent-based spaces and things like that. And I think now with sort of COVID conscientiousness, um, it's just another level of like really intentional thought and care that has to go into planning immersive events um, or live events in general right now. And I think, I agree with Monica that I think a lot of producers um, that, that are sort of in our, on our radar, in our sphere have been very careful and very 
um, like conscious about how how they want to bring back people together because I think we are craving connectivity. And even though uh, you know ticket sales might not reflect that yet um, because people are so nervous or because ticket prices uh, even some people might be pricing their events a little too high, not really recognizing the depression that has sort of happened across box offices in general. Um, but I think people are craving like in-person experiences. They just want to know that those experiences are going to be safe. Um, and like, you know, they're just having to compare their own level of uh, safety or like risk, risk analysis to whatever the event is offering. And I think one of the great things about how uh, like small our company is, is that we can execute very quickly, we can move very quickly, we can be swift. So when we decide we want this level of safety or this level of, um, you know, risk mitigation, we can do that very easily. It is interesting how COVID has affected the arts, but immersive in particular. Um, and again, I'm going to invite uh, any questions from the audience. But something I'm curious about is, um, you, you know, we, we can all kind of make fun of the selfie palaces. And then, you know, we can maybe even look a little bit with some jealousy at a big operation like Meow Wolf and the, the numbers they turn. But I think, you know, in general, we've kind of thought, well, it's audience building. It's bringing people a different experience. Maybe it'll change the appetite. Um, and with that in mind, I, I think about the Denver Film Fest as being something similar, as it's really audience building for a different kind of theater, different kind of art. Um, have you noticed, are your audiences different when you're basically as box office sits inside of a film fest versus coming through another channel? Yeah. And if so, like, what, what, what's different? Yeah, this oh, is definitely Indicate too, Lauren. Oh yeah, Indicate, right. Oh yeah, this is so interesting. Yes, basically different audiences come with different engagement assumptions. So, immer so film festival audiences, we have found if they really came to the festival not expecting to do interactive and then did impulsively buy a ticket, they tend to be hesitant and confused to start. <laughs> That's the defining quality. Not in a bad, not like in a way, I mean, but in no way derisive. Yeah, but totally. They, they bought the ticket. They're there, but they're a little like, whoa. There's like a deer in the headlights moment yeah. when they're like, what did I get myself yeah. into yeah. before totally. they open up yeah. into the experience? Yeah. Totally. And I think they're fearful of whatever their worst memory or idea of audience interaction is. Right. Nobody but wants to be at the magic show no one wants and, to and get pulled up on stage show. and be made a fool of. Yeah, and ours is so not about, I mean, nothing we're doing is even close to that. <laughs> Often you're not, what, what most people don't realize about our work at least is you're not on stage in front of other audience members ever. You're actually, there are, there are no other, there's no audience really in our work. You're, you're all just a part of it. You're all collaborating together. And we do, I do think we do a good job of making people feel that way. So usually they relax. Um, we also have presented our work more than once at a festival for gamers. It's called Indicate. It's the Festival of Independent Games. They started doing a live performance division. We, um, the first year we did it, which was with the Hamlet Mobile, we won the Game Design Award. And uh, we didn't design that show as a game. Like, yeah. but they're like, kind of- It wasn't a game. <laughs> yeah, they, well, and they're like, well, what is a game? That's like kind of their whole thing as a festival is like, woo which we kind of which we love uh and and to be fair there was there are some there are some aspects of it that are game adjacent certainly like you you're trying to collect all eight of the hamlet segments and there's a punch card and stuff and, you and i think they said that you know the more you engaged and the more you yeah. returned to play the more you revealed and that was one of their characteristics of what is a game yeah which is true um, that's true. There were layers of narrative that you could only unlock through coming back to the Hamlet wheel several times, seeing different segments. I, so I, I, I stand by the word. It was very, it was awesome and very honored. Um, and they, but that crowd, because they're all gamers or play testers or just like thinking in those ways, they would come in and immediately like uh, try to find the edges of the game, like bust yeah. out and try to be like, can I grab this? Can I touch this? Can I poke you? Can I do? So we had to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. like, how do we quickly channel all that very positive energy into something that um, kind of still flows with the narrative we're attempting to take you through in this case, because uh, it's not just a total open world, um, but also because they are game players, they're used to reading clues as to the interactivity once they've been in the space for a few moments. So they, they, they adapt very quickly, I think, but yeah, it's all different. 
yeah. it's all different people. You know, people who LARP are tend to kind of like adopt a character when they show up, even if they're allowed to just be themselves. Like, yeah, everybody kind of picks their style they're familiar with, which is kind of fun. Yeah, I think that's like jumping off that, that's actually, we typically, uh, and especially in our most recent work, um, don't impress a character upon the audience. Like the audience doesn't have to be or adopt any kind of persona. Uh, they can just show up as they are. Um, there are, but like Lauren said, there are some people who totally get into character and like become a whole nother person. Um, we have a show called Red Flags, which is sort of a simulation of a bad date. Um, and we've had audience members just like completely invent their whole backstory and they're like, and they're sort of experiencing the show as this character, um, even though, you know, who they are in real life uh, would not necessarily make the same choices or react in the same way. Um, so it's actually really interesting, like who decides to just be themselves uh, and who decides to sort of adopt a character and play it as a character. It's fascinating to think about how we open uh, in immersive, we open up to uh, lots of different audience types. And I have to say, Lauren, hesitant and confused would be a great name for a show. I know I would buy a ticket. For <laughs> make it, so. But then the sequel, Embarrassed and Exposed. Yeah, there you go. You can have a whole series. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> that makes me laugh. I love it. Um, you've done a lot of different kinds of shows. And um, I, I'm just curious. And again, I, I know a lot of the folks in the audience here are experienced producers and, and performers. But like, what are some big takeaways? I mean, when you when you workshop and you start to create, what are some of those guardrails you've discovered or some of those bright lights that you always try to guide your creations toward? Well, I think there's two ways to, to break that down. One is um, sort of like me mechanics and, and like the immersive mechanisms that you build into the show for like best practice or, or that lead to success. And then there's sort of the creative emotional stuff, um, which just comes from, I think, doing the work and being an artist and asking for feedback and listening to it. <laughs> it's a big one. Um, but I would say in terms of mechanics, like what we've learned is you have to introduce an audience to what they will need to do in the show within the first 10 minutes of an experience, five, 10 minutes, uh, you know, of a, of a full length piece or immediately in a mini piece, um, show them the range of ways that they may have to interact so that they're prepped for it and then build intimacy over time. I think we learned a lot of that in Red Flags in developing that show and we've, we've carried it with us um, after that. So within Red Flags, you're, you're going on this date and when you arrive, the character asks if she can give you a hug and it's a, it's a gut check because, or a heat check almost, we need to know if that person's comfortable with physical touch, you know, light touch, a hug, a, a hand on the shoulder, the knee, that kind of thing. And if they say like, no, I don't want to hug. It's a huge clue for the actor. Like, okay, I'm going to pull back a little bit physically. I'm going to give them a little more space. Um, I'm not going to put my hand on their knee probably so that they feel comfortable. Um, you also, uh, she asks you a bunch of questions like, oh, so what part of town do you live in? If you don't ask her the question back, which most of us are kind of primed to do on a, in a dating environment, we, we want to be a good date. But if you don't do it because you're nervous or confused and hesitant, whatever, she'll say, aren't you going to ask me where I live? It's going to be super boring if you don't ask me any questions about me. Sorry. And the character is sort of blunt. So that that makes sense in the world of the show. So I think something we we really strive for is finding organic ways to introduce the rules of the world into the show so that you're not presented with a list of rules that when you check in, if there is even a check-in. And if you do get rules at check-in, there's no more than three and they're very clear. So that so that guardrails are so simple and we really design so that people don't need a lot of supervision. Yeah. 
And then I would say we don't think of any of that until like pretty far into development. Like, yeah, like we develop original work in a very intuitive way where we're really trying to follow our own curiosity as an excitement as the main guidepost. And like really, really trying to be expansive and bold and trying to pick ideas where we're like, ooh, I don't know if that would be safe. We don't know if there's a safe way to do that. We wanna make sure in the development room, like in the rehearsal room, that like we can pitch ideas that really do take us off the path we've been on before, which means that like the principles of safety and consent and um, making things accessible physically, uh, like those are things that like are in us as artists um, and they are, they are gonna come up in the process. Um, and also we try, we want to make sure we're sort of like trusting that those things will be innately in us to, to a degree where like, we're not going to go very far down the path and suddenly discover we've created a hugely problematic situation that just doesn't happen. I think because we're, you know, trying not to be, we're trying to be not total assholes in the world, which, you know, we're all human, but we're really trying to make theater that would feel nourishing to us if we were to encounter it. So that tends to get us a lot of the way there and then we and then we do at a certain point really shift over what Monica's talking about which is like okay now actually though how are we going to make this totally airtight and simple and elegant uh, it's more like I get to put my hat on as a production manager and be like okay so here are all the things that like make me nervous <laughs> as a stage manager um and then usually yeah but it's it's like a layer that gets added in um so as not to inhibit the development of the work right from the beginning. Because if you start off just limiting yourself, well, we can't do any of these things because they're unsafe, uh, then you know what you're left with might not be the most exciting version of that idea. So. Yeah, and then we play test, we bring people in. Yes, we test, we test thoroughly. Yeah. That's the other part of it for sure. It's oh. a big one. And that's a great word to bring from game development, play test, not rehearsal, play test. I guess the same thing, but in a sense. Well, I'm going to invite one more time if, if anybody in the audience has questions. Christine I know you probably has a question. Do. Does Christine yeah. have a question? It's yeah, it's in the chat. chat. Yeah, I dropped it in the chat. Um, oh, I see. I don't have chat up. Oh, you have to read it out loud. All right. Um, so I was wondering uh, how you first connected with the Denver Film Festival in the first place, and uh, if being site flexible is a consideration when you're developing your shows. Hmm. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start there. We don't think about that until late. Um, and then I would say a lot of our shows ultimately could be maybe half or something. Yeah, I'd say a majority. Probably. Yeah, like 60, 40, maybe. Yeah. Um, like uh, but we don't think of it if we like the idea and it could only ever be done in this one place, we would do it. So be it. Yeah. Um, but uh, but we like when it turns out, oh great, we can. Um, that's really nice. Uh mm -hmm. And well, fire season is an example of that. So it was originally written for a very specific location, Paramount Ranch in Los Angeles, that was uh, the site of a really big wildfire in 2018. Um, but the show has enough big universal themes um, that the actual specific geographical information can be reworked depending on where we produce it. So that's actually like a perfect example of that. Yeah, Monica's rewritten it to now be very specific to this Colorado landscape, which is cool. And it was a fun challenge. Um, yeah, and I would say in Denver, we, we first got connected to the festival through um, the sort of immersive hub uh, person that was Landon Zakheim that I mentioned earlier. Um, he um, curated us. And then through that first year, we ended up meeting some of the other folks who are kind of connect, end up connecting different people in this scene out here. Um, and that's how we met uh, Charlie Miller at DCPA, which is how we ended up being brought back there a couple of years later for that, for our blind date show there at the um, Modern Art Museum. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's sort of just been like, once you start showing up, you kind of meet people and then you get to keep showing up. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's been our Denver connection. And it's been very nice. I think one year when we were here, we got to go to, there was even like a one day immersive Denver summit or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, we got to go for, I think we split a ticket. <laughs> I think yeah, that's right. The Hamlet Mobile year, so. Yeah, that's right. That was yeah. really fun. The year it snowed. Yeah. It snowed, didn't it? Yeah. 
we just and we try to keep ourselves like I'm excited to uh we haven't been to actually any meow wolves before and we're gonna go to the, the one here on Wednesday. Wednesday. I'm so curious. I'm so curious how what people here think of it and I'm just curious to experience it. So we like we to also of course had the original Denver immersive experience of going to Casa Bonita the first time we came. So yes. well then you're you're set. You'll find out. Meow's wonderful, but Casa Bonita is better. So it's better. <laughs> uh great. Can't wait. <laughs> Yeah, well, we love having you having you all out. Um, any any last questions? Otherwise, I have kind of a wrap up question. And these guys are on West Coast time. You know, they still have their evening in front of them. That's true. We have to eat after this. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, I'll ask a question, David. Hi, guys. Hi. So, um, so with your guys's creative process and being like a company, do you feel an oblig? Um, so it comes to like uh, show pacing and cadence. So when you're creating concepts and like designing ideas, as soon as a show ends, do you feel like an obligation or a pressure to continue creating momentum from that? Or is it more based on the concepts that you're wanting to create, right? And which do you feel is better for your creative process versus what you're trying to do with the company? Oh, what good big questions. <laughs> well, I feel the pressure, <laughs> but we've really, we've really been in a rhythm for the last, I mean, honestly, the whole time we've been a company yeah. of, of one major new work a year. And that tends to work, you know, because like capital W, we are now at a point where we pay ourselves when we perform a writer, director, production manager, like, which is great and feels really healthy, but we not are a not big wage. Just yeah, so like, just, you know, token stipends, but yeah. like we're not making our livings from capital W. So yeah, balancing like our artistic life with our paid work, our other creative endeavors, our families, blah, blah, blah. Um, that rhythm has made a lot of sense for us. Yeah, I would say one of the spaces I would like us to grow more as a company, when we've had ebbs and flows of being effective at this, it probably needs a fourth main member to fully flourish in its own department is the touring of previously created shows. That really should be one person's only job is creating relationships with institutions that might actually produce local versions of those shows. I, I, would, I think it'd be cool to do down the line. I'm, I'm saying it needs to be a fourth person because I know we're at this point pretty well where the creative juices of the three people in capital W now lie. And that's not really anybody's like favorite thing to do. People here, we can do it, all three of us, but nobody like, no one's like, I can't wait to get out of bed and contact a presenting organization. Like <laughs> no one here feels that way. So I would say um, I, that would be a cool place for us to keep growing so that we can, what we have learned is you do have to be in love with the activity you're doing in the company or you'll burn out. We are all of us in love with creating new work and creating the systems that will support that work. Um, and we can have a fun time by translating when we translate that work to a new place. But I would say we really tend to spend most of our time moving on to the next piece is the truth of it. No, that's not bad. It means we made a lot of cool pieces. It just would yeah. also be cool. It would be, you know, it would be nice to also additionally continue to find good ways to use the stuff we've already made too so more people can access it. Yeah. Well, it's also, I mean, I just love touring. I love yeah. it. Like I'm just a real junkie for it. Um, so yeah, that would be fun. And we've talked about it. But yeah. Yeah. And like I said, we've, we're doing it right now. Like it happens. Yeah. Sometimes. Even when we try really hard to not look for it to happen, so we're we're about. It would be cool to to keep evolving there. I'd say, yeah. It's a good question. So I tell you what, I'll um, I, I just I, my my wrap up here is, you know, do you have any you know personal aspirations for the form that you'd like to share with your fellow creatives? Anything you'd like to see immersive get into or aspire to or be do or change? I want an immersive show to win the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> I really do. I want an immersive show to tour to the um, droves of audience that Hamilton tours to. That's my dream, is that somebody figure out something that's so, un it's an undeniable cultural touchstone of before and after that is interactive and theatrical and narrative. 
that's that's it because i want it to be one of the core touchstones one of the core pillars of art like a type of art that people think about in that way the way they do about like a broadway musical um so yeah that's mine <laughs> just that small thing <laughs> yeah and that's how i feel about broadway musicals broadway musicals <laughs> Um, Christine? Um, I would say, I mean, uh, on a more like <laughs> directly personal level, uh, I would just, I would like to see immersive experiences, not necessarily um, theater based experiences, but not um, like selfie museums, something that has a narrative that has, uh, you know, a performative element to it. Um, I would like to see that popping up in more spaces uh, that don't necessarily depend on having a pre-existing theater community in that space. Um, so, because I think there is so much untapped creative potential in all of the different ways you can apply immersive experiences outside of theatrical spaces. Um, and I would, I would like to see the industry, I hate using that word for like to describe immersive work, but I'd like to see more opportunities in that space crop up in other places that aren't just New York, LA, et cetera. Yeah. yeah similarly, I would like to see the field become uh, more diverse. And I mean that in mm -hmm. every sense of the word. And I'd like to see it become more accessible. Yes. Um, and that's physical accessibility, that's economic accessibility, um, I think that definitely in LA and, and from what I've seen at conferences and whatnot, I think this field is pretty white and, um, you know, people who end up in it and can afford to do this kind of work are people who, you know, have college degrees and um, are able to sustain themselves some other way. So uh, seeing like sort of a national infrastructure to support this work, and this goes into like my pipe dreams, but like federal funding for the arts, and, um, you know, the things we really, really need as a society, because art is one of our, you know, art, art is the hammer with which to shape the future. Um, I really believe that. And I would, I, and I think this is such an important particular hammer, this set of tools that we have. So I would just like to see them shared with more people um, and more broadly. Well, that's awesome. Well, my, my aspiration is, I'll put this link in the, the chat, is that uh, the, the local community get out and support our, our friends from LA and elsewhere. Um, if you don't have money to buy a ticket, go find your friends that have money and make them take you on a date to go see this. There are ways to make this happen. Um, but we really thank you guys for spending um, an hour with us talking about this. Good luck with the show. Um, and um, I'm really excited about what uh, you can bring to a film festival audience. So I think, again, one of the big tenets of Immersive Denver has always been audience building, just trying to get more people to understand what this is so that they'll take a chance and go through their hesitation and confusion, perhaps. Um, but with that, I don't know if you have any other closing remarks, but I just want to say thanks. Oh, and I have to say this, everybody go to the Denver, uh, immersivedenver.com website. And if you're not on the mailing list, sign up for it. Um, that's what we do. We send out newsletters. Thanks so much for having us. us. Great. Very fun. Awesome. awesome. Hope to see you this week. All right. Bye-bye.